but I will try, I will try. Um, my name is Christina Matuziak, and I'm a faculty member in the Library Information Science program at the University of Denver. And I'm going to talk about the uh, findings of the study that I conducted last fall, and it was on user interaction with the DPLA in the context, really, of teaching and learning in uh, higher education. Uh, a little bit about the background. I actually am a former digitization librarian. I worked uh, in digitization uh, for 10 years. I was the head of the digitization unit at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And the interest actually in user study goes back to my work in digitization. And I, th I think many of you who are working in practice often wonder, how are those collections used? And this was actually a question I you know, ask myself uh, many times when I worked, you know, on building um, uh, collections was whether, you know, the questions that I had, how are they being used? And I was primarily interested in, in academic use since I was at the um, uh, university. Uh, but also, you know, whether the, the way we structure those collections, how we describe the objects, is it really aligned with the way uh, teachers and students are using is really meaning, you know, the way we develop them very much on the record-based model <laughs> that is such a legacy of that in, in, in libraries and archives. Is it really aligned with, with uh, user needs? I was also interested in resource discovery. So I've been doing e user studies for, uh, I would say, last uh, 10 years, and uh, my dissertation research was very much on use of digital resources in um, undergraduate um, education. And I have to admit that the findings of my early studies were not very encouraging, okay? Because what I did, you know, find in those studies that there was really limited awareness of digital collections uh, among students and even among faculty. Um, and they found, uh, even if those who used them, they found research discovery really difficult, okay? Because we built that amount of digitized materials, you know, for last over t uh, last 20 years, and it's really a remarkable amount of, of, of you know digitized books, journals, images, uh, sound recordings. But they are all sitting in those silos, okay? And if you are at the National Archives, Smithsonian, Library of Congress, you have the visibility. But if you are a small historical society in Wisconsin, Oregon, Colorado, you know Texas, that's a little bit harder. You may be known to your local. Um, users, but not necessarily be, a, you know, the content can be discovered um, uh, around. So um, I got actually very excited when uh, the DPLA was launched <laughs> because I, you know, felt like, oh, this is really a way to, to bring the resources uh, together. But it is really a new information environment, okay, where uh, we are aggregating um, uh, resources from, you know, now hundreds of, of uh, contributing institutions. And there are some layers in the research discovery. So this was a primary interest that I had. How do users navigate, and how do they understand that structure? How do they make sense through, you know, navigating through layers uh, of the um, DPLA? Uh, so these were the questions I, I actually posed for my study. So my primary interest was really in user understanding of kind of navigating and discovering um, uh, the resources. I was curious about the nature of, of their uh, experience. And then the third question I had was how uh, they can use the resources that they find in the DPLA for teaching and learning. So I designed a study that was conducted uh, last fall, um, and it was a primarily qualitative approach, although some of the data I'm now analyzing has you know, a quantitative component, but it was primarily qualitative uh, study, because I really wanted to observe um, the user interact with DPLA. Not only ask them questions, because sometimes what people say in the surveys <laughs> is quite different from what they do in real life, but I really wanted to observe them and, and record the sessions. I have really uh, good data uh, for data analysis. And then, you know, um, ask additional questions in the follow-up. Um, uh, interviews. So I started with a questionnaire, kind of basic questionnaire, and one of the questions was posted earlier. So it was the questionnaire was very much on kind of 
you know, demographic data and background data about you know, user prior uh, use of, of especially large scale digital libraries and their kind of research habits. How do they go about finding information for their academic um, needs? And one of the questions at the end was kind of open ended what's your ideal? kind of system, what do you want to use? And what it came in that last question was kind of interesting. Everybody was kind of talking about, oh, I would like to have that one-stop shop where I can go and find all the all the uh, resources for my uh, research. And that was prior, um, actually, to the study. And then, um, the, the really, the heart of the study was um, uh, direct observations, where um, I designed uh, two sort of kind of predefined scenarios and ask the uh, participants to conduct, and the scenarios were kind of developed in consultation with faculty in the history department. Um, and uh, the observations were uh, recorded, and after the, the uh, participants uh, finished the first two predefined scenarios, I encouraged them to search on the topics of their own academic interest, so they could do a minimum of, of uh, two of their own um, scenarios. And after that, I um, conducted interviews and asked them basically about their experience, and you know, I had additional questions of, you know, about the uh, uh, navigation. The sessions lasted about 16 minutes to 90 minutes, depending how talkative <laughs> uh, some of the participants were, and the interviews were uh, transcribed, uh, or they were recorded and, and uh, transcribed. So I selected, and that was done on purpose, uh, primary participants from um, uh, history, social studies, and humanities, because that's the primary audience, really, for, for the uh, uh, DPLA. Uh, the participants were selected from, the, from my university, which is a private university, mostly with graduate populations. So that's why you see a higher representation of, of graduates uh, rather than undergraduates. Um, and uh, the rec recruitment was done basically by e emailing um, uh, uh, faculty in those departments, and I have to admit librarians were very helpful, <laughs> helped me to distribute the, the emails to faculty, and also by posting flyers um, in the library so you know people could contact me. So you can see basically the, the breakdown. Uh, I had two faculty who, you know, recruiting faculty is really a hard <laughs> thing to do. So you had one faculty from history, the other from art history. 13 graduate students from multiple programs, um, art history, communication, education. There is a special program in emergent digital practices, it's very much communication and web design, um, international studies, and a couple of uh, PhD students from religious studies and Spanish, and, and a number of undergraduates. So the total of 21, and at the, I think around 18 or 19, I kind of felt I actually I'm seeing patterns and a lot of repetition. So I basically stopped at 21 because there was really not much new data coming at that at that um, at that point. Any questions here about the design? Yeah, I have two questions. Mm. Yes, yes. No, 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 no. These were, I mean, students were recruited, but it was, yeah, it was separate from. Individually. Individually, one on one, basically, yeah. It would be very difficult to do it as a group, frankly, <laughs> you know. So these were individual sessions, yeah. And each one lasted, a minimum was 60 minutes, some were like 90 minutes, yeah. For the entire session, so like the observation was approximately about half an hour to 40 minutes. And yeah. How, how do you assume you had three, or do you just usually organize like in the conclusion report? I have a research assistant, okay, who did the transcripts, <laughs> but I, I I participated in every single session and I observed all the students. Okay. All right, so these are the scenarios, and again, I you know, discussed it with a faculty member in the history department, so this was sort of based on some of the assignments that are done. So the, in the first one, uh, the students were asked to, to, to look for an image and a map related to the history of railroads, and again, I'm from Colorado, <laughs> so the history of railroads in the western states, okay? 
Um, and the students were, that was very important to me. Uh, they were asked to complete a scenario from the point of searching the DPLA to the point of, you know, evaluating the results and downloading the resource to the computer, okay? I also asked them uh, to look at the permissions and rights and kind of tell me whether they are finding in permissions, although for students was not so critical. But for some graduate students who are publishing materials, finding the rights information is important. So I also asked them to look at the, you know, whether they are finding uh, rights uh, information and how would they use that um, uh, uh, resource. So I asked them to download. And by completing scenarios, I mean finding a research, evaluating it, and downloading to the computer, not just finding it um, online. Uh, the second uh, scenario, was, um, I asked them to look for a sound recording, for an audio recording with a uh, civil rights activist, and again, through the same process, finding a resource, and then downloading it to a, um, to a computer and looking for rights information, okay? And then in the scenario three and four is where the participants were um, ask basically to search on topics of their own interest that is related actually to academic work. And it was a really a wide range of topics depending really on their majors, you know, their programs from uh, Native American history. They were looking for um, um, images of spe specific artists and photographers. Um, textual materials related to, to their topics. One student was looking for materials on African-American clergy, um, biblical uh, materials. It was really a wide range of, of topics. So a few were uh, very unsuccessful, uh, really related to their studies, like somebody was looking specifically for like educational standards in Colorado. No, no, you're not going to find it in, in the PLA. But in most cases, they were able actually to find uh, resources that were related to, to their um, topics. So um, I grouped the findings sort of into, into three um, um, kind of sections. And the first one it was very much kind of like, what was the nature of user experience? Because it was one of the questions that I posed in the interviews after the session was like, how do you feel about searching DPLA? You know, how did it work for you? Um, so uh, this came from the uh, questionnaire was the prior use. So again, remember it's 21 students, mostly graduate. Uh, students and I asked them about the three large-scale digital libraries. Have you heard about it? Have you used it? Okay. So for DPLA, we had um, four participants that heard about it, two actually used, zero for Europeana, which was kind of surprising <laughs> for me. Um, and then um, Hathi Trust was um, six uh, heard about it, five used it, and probably the reason is that we actually are members of Hathi Trust and students are actually using it for uh, for projects. I have a quote from a participant who heard about it, and she associated it with Robert Darton. So somebody, I think, at the beginning of the um, DPLA fest says that the D is for Darton, and there's a reason, <laughs> probably, even people who have not used it, uh, at least associated DPLA with Robert Darton. One student um, who used it said he, was, he used it actually for a class project, and uh, one of the uh, instructor uh, encouraged them to, to use DPLA as a source of images for, for a digital project the students were working. The other person who used it was an a instructor in art history, and again, it was a source of images actually for her um, um, lecture PowerPoint presentations. Um, so I did not intend to do a usability study. It was really not my <laughs> interest. I assume it was done actually in the phase of development because that's where you do usability. But those findings came sort of as a first and they were quite very powerful. So I'm reporting them really because the first question that I asked, how do you feel about using the DPLA? Most of the questions were really kind of on uh, design and, and, and interaction. And, and really most of them were very positive. Okay, students liked it. Um, they, they emphasized that it was easy to use and some coms, uh, comments were about the, you know, clear la layout, um, you know, nice, you know, modern um, uh, design, you know, aesthetically pleasing uh, uh, design. One student, uh, and I have a quote here, um, noticed that, which, which was I think an interesting observation, that um, the site is accessible to a wide of range of, of users, you know, with different levels of, of um, expertise. And the one that I think is, is, is kind of funny, but it was really meant in a positive way that DPLA is kind of a Google 
you know, Google for libraries, <laughs> you know, which was kind of, kind of um, uh, interesting. So most of the comments sort of on the user interaction were quite um, uh, positive. Um, and then what I was really in interested in, how do they understand the whole model and that the navigation through multiple layers? And um, again, most of the quotes are, you know, coming from, from the participants. I think they got it, that it's actually like a, you know, one shopping stop, and that's the language from the, uh, fr from the interviews, that this is really a point where they can go and access resources from um, uh, multiple uh, institutions, okay? So this was, uh, this was quite um, uh, interesting. Uh, and and I, I think I'm going to get, you know, back to that really one, you know, stop shopping when I talk about the navigation. But uh, most of those quotes came from interviews. And, and again, I think that the fact that the resources are aggregated and, stu and, and participants can access them from one point was really very um, uh, positively received. Um, a little bit about the navigation. Uh, one of the features that was used, I would say, I think by 20 out of 21 students was the refine feature, okay? Uh, not necessarily the first search, but when they saw a large number of results, they tended to limit, bec be, uh, and mostly by the format, so image or sound, uh, sound recording or text, okay? And even if they didn't use it the first time, they noticed it the second time, and they were able to, to um, re uh, narrow down the searches by using those. That was actually very, very effective. One of the students who did not use it at all, and she performed all keyword searching, was an international student, and I think it was like her second month really being here in the States. She was really not familiar with the type of searching. She basically did a keyword searching, but all other students actually used the, the refine feature and used the facets really to, to, to limit the searches very effectively. And they liked the fact that the different types of, of um, resources, so visual, uh, textual, sound, were kind of indicated and you could narrow down um, by those facets. So it was really uh, well um, received. Um, the use of map for narrowing down um, research, I, I was kind of mixed, frankly, <laughs> you know. Some participants were able to use the map actually quite effectively, but others did not understand that if you narrow by the location, it's really by the location of the inst contributing institutions. They thought that the resources were actually about that place. In some cases, that's true, you know, because the local historical societies have materials about the area, but not necessarily, okay? So this was, you know, kind of mixed results and uh, sometimes um, confusing. And then finally, this, this came up multiple times, and it's, it came from graduate student. Is there an advanced search, okay? And I have an example here of a, of a search that one of the students um, uh, constructed. And I have not seen Boolean like that in a long time, I have to tell you, since I taught probably library instruction many, many years ago. And I was really surprised by the way they were searching. It was really very specific with truncation, nested searches, and you know all that stuff. And, um, but again, remember these are graduate students. All of them uh, had library instruction. and. If any of you are, you know, into in library instruction, there is really a real impact <laughs> on the way students search if they receive that training, okay? But they transfer this type of information behavior into an environment that not necessarily supports it, okay? So they were looking for advanced search really, you know, to narrow down their, their, uh, their searches. It's just because it's a learned behavior and they expect other libraries, like library databases, to have this uh, similar uh, support. So I think this was one of the uh, critical comments that there is no way, you know, to search. I'm not sure whether it's actually necessary to search like that in DDPLA, but again, that's that expectation or inf learned information behavior that uh, expert searchers will have, that they look really for um, uh, uh, advanced searches. And um, it really came, also as a behavior that, that they perceive as important into narrowing uh, down their searches where you have really abundant um, uh, information. So they find that, you know, very specific keyword searching or Boolean searching as a way of narrowing down and finding more specific um, information. So I'm going to move into navigation. Any questions about the previous part? 
because actually navigation was probably the most interesting part of the, of the research. So in addition to asking participants really about their uh, experience, I then uh, took the data that was recorded and analyzed it for, for scenario completion. So this is done on the level of, sen of scenario. Uh, and that I only analyze predefined scenarios because there is some consistency because everybody did that. The other, are, you know, there is not that much consistency between them. And I'm going to, to actually <laughs> drill that down in further analysis on a task level. So not just a scenario completion, but, you know, tasks like finding permissions, you know, downloading and all that stuff. So out of the, you know, um, uh, 42, 36 were completed, but they were four that were uncompleted, it's that participants were not able to find a resource, okay? And then after sometimes trying multiple times, they could not find a, uh, find a resource. Two actually um, were not completed because there were broken links <laughs> at, the, at the participating in, uh, institutions. There was some confusion actually, you know, both in the, in the in behavior but also expressed in the interviews about navigation through the, um, uh, through the sites. Um, and seven actually, and that's again uh, based on analyzing those scenarios and, you know, that they were actually confused, you know, and that had difficulty um, of finding the information. And, you know, again, it's an artificial situation, you know, we are sitting them in front of the computer asking them to, to, to do it. Whether they would persist and continue in a natural circumstances, I don't know. Okay, so it's possible that the rate of incompletion would be higher, you know, in a natural environment where, you know, they don't feel like, well, here I am, somebody's watching me and I have to finish. So, so, so the, I, my suspicion is that the rate of completion probably in a natural environment would be um, higher. There was one user who was extremely frustrated and after trying to, to complete it, she gave up and she went to YouTube. And she was pretty outspoken <laughs> about it. So, so there the, the were behaviors like that too. All right. Um, so sources of confusion. I, there is obviously different graphic, um, you know, interfaces. You know, when you move from DPLA to participating institutions, and for some participants, that's a source of confusion because you are ending up in a different um, environment. And then once they connected to the uh, partner institutions. Uh, some of them had actually difficulty retracing their steps and going back to the DPLA. They did not notice that the tabs were open and could actually move <laughs> through the tabs, but it was just not apparent to them. And then the three-step navigation process going from DPLA through the service hub and then linking finally to the object in the uh, contributing institutions was probably the most difficult one and the source. Like actually, all the incomplete scenarios happened at that in that phase, okay? So I have a couple quotes from, uh, from participants about the sources of confusion. So again, it's the different, you know, graphical layout of, of participating institutions and then kind of moving through the steps and sometimes kind of getting lost in that trail was another um, uh, uh, source of confusion. I, before I get into the three step, I need to mention that this was seamless. You know, if, if, if uh, participants were searching uh, the DPLA and just connecting to the content hub where this is just one click from DPLA, that was seamless. And the fact that it was a different interface didn't bother. Most of them actually did not notice it <laughs> at that time. So when you start, you know, get confused and lost, then you pay attention. But at this point, th this was seamless. There was no actually uh, problems with that uh, type of search. So what the confusion happened actually in the three-step process. Uh, so the user started, you know, searching at the DPLA. Uh, and this is actual example. That's, that's what happened. Um, and they get connected to the service hub that does not have a visual clue. So there's no thumbnail. This comes from Mount Mountain West, okay? And what happens here, okay, so this is a quote from a participant who kind of got lost. He felt like, you know, there was no image where I am, okay? So it does not meet their expectations because they are moving from a record that has that visual thumbnail again to the service hub and there's no visual and they think they got to a wrong place, okay? Um, so some of them actually, once they got to Mountain West, 
repeated their <laughs> searches and they were searching within that site, okay? Um, so again, the incomplete happened here at this point, okay? And some of them actually were able to, 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 to link to the contributing institution. Exactly. Well, I know it's obvious to us, okay? <laughs> okay, so, so this is, this is, this is where most of the issues uh, happened, was actually in this, 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 um, uh, this search, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So I think. Yeah. So so I, again, that one participant who got frustrated and lost lost was actually tried at that at that uh, stage uh, at that stage too. And again, you know, because it is a study, you know, what would happen in natural? You know, some some of the actually participants tried and they were able to figure it out and learn. And then if they did another scenario and happened to be at, at the service hub, they, they learned, and the next time, of course, it worked fine for them. Yes? Yes. No, this is, the, you are moving into Mountain View. Yeah, so this is, then you are, so that's one of those students I think did that, and then she said, well, I kind of got down, lost in that trail, because then they are searching within that, and it takes them a while to grasp that this is really a different, a different site. Yeah, any other questions or comments? So I just want to sum that up. It is time consuming. Those searches were much longer, especially if they have to figure it out, okay? And we know time is pressure. So you know whether, you know, students, I think it really depends on their motivation and how badly they need that resource. But we know that resources are abandoned. abundant. So you know how, how much time they would naturally spend. So the, it was really confu confusing. And I think for most participants, it was actually quite developing a different mental model because it's not how they normally search, okay? Once they learned, you know, in subsequent searches, they were fine, okay? But, uh, but it really, really required, required, some, uh, required some effort. Um, but I have to admit I was really surprised when I um, asked uh, questions about this type of searching in my interviews. And most of them, they said they didn't mind, okay? That they were used to this type of, well, one student said, I don't like it, but I'm used to. I'm willing to do it if I'm interested. And I think a lot of those quotes kind of speak to that. And I think that phrase, I'm used to it, it, it came almost in all the answers that they know this type of searching. They expect to jump from one site to another and to move through different uh, sites, actually, that even are, you know, have different visual uh, designs because this is the nature of online searching, okay? And they learned about it. Um, I think many uh, referred to um, a tool that um, uh, my library uh, subscribed to, and it's Summon, and we are moving to uh, Primo, but it is a federated uh, search tool that searches across uh, 600 plus databases. So students start on, the, on that federated search tool, and they move to different databases. And they, almost everybody referred to that as sort of a similar model that they know this type of searching from the library search, or they had training in Summon, and they know how, that this is a way of, of conducting research, okay? Which I think is important observation because of the population that I worked with. I am not sure whether this searching will actually work the same with different segments of DPLA audience. So like public library users, K through 12, that actually does not use federated searching on their databases. So this actually participants had somewhat similar model to the way that DPLA um, operates. But they, and again, they said they were willing to actually uh, uh, put up with this. Um, and it's something that um, um, uh, they were familiar. And for many, it was actually seamless searching. Not everybody experienced, you know, uh, a difficulty. So, so it was only a small number of participants that were confused. Um, some of actually kind of pointed out to advantages of the distributed model, so this was not necessarily a hindrance, but in many ways a plus because, and 
they sort of comp compared it to healthy trust, which is centralized, okay? And they felt like DPLA is actually pointing them to the originating institutions. And they can go to those sites and often they are not aware of them or they would not think about searching them, okay? But uh, from DPLA, they can get into those, you know, participating institutions and this gives more visibility to those institutions, but also, um, you know, exposes users to, to a wider range of, of, of resources. So, so this was sort of a positive um, finding too. And I don't have a lot of time, but I want to finish with, with um, some of the questions I asked actually about using DPLA as a resource for teaching and, and learning. And um, in uh, the interviews, you know, uh, several of the participants, you know, pointed out that this is great because the resources are credible and they come from libraries. You wouldn't believe how much trust they put in libraries of <laughs> in archives, <laughs> that the materials are curated, that they are all well described. I, sometimes it's too much pressure, I think. Uh, but that's, that's what really is. They do see it as a credible and they don't have to spend time evaluating and you know whether it's a credible resource or not. Uh, several of them uh, noticed that it's a publicly available uh, publicly available resources versus you know subscribed databases uh, that they get through uh, through the library. Another point was that there is a variety of resources in multiple formats from one search. Okay, so if you think about library database, it's primarily textual, okay? You, you get mostly textual materials. If you want images, you have to go to art store, or if, you know, so, but this was, you know, for many of them was really yeah, a nice uh, thing that it was really, you know, you could get images. Many of them were really surprised by the availability of sound recordings. They never think about it as a resource actually for, um, uh, for um, uh, teaching and learning. One of the participants was a creative writing student who um, uses images as a source of inspiration. And she also, she also is a teaching assistant and she uses images in teaching writing. And she says, oh my God, this is awesome. I'm going to use sound recordings now, again, as a, as a source of inspiration for, for, um, for students. Um, this quote comes from an instructor from a faculty in the history department. Uh, so I, this is not a surprise for most faculty. We are looking for images for PowerPoint presentations for lectures, and she found it as a wonderful resource. She was also uh, looking for, for uh, resources that were related to her um, uh, research area, which is uh, China and very narrow milk industry in China, which is kind of unusual. And she was surprised because she found a number of resources that were related to her topic. And then two days later, she emailed me and she said, well, I found more, <laughs> you know, so it was actually pretty nice. Um, another TA, a PhD student, uh, felt like this would be a good teaching research, but again, it's potential. I mean, that awareness is still very limited that uh, could be used as a, as a resource actually in the, um, in the classroom. Um, the use by graduate students actually was very interesting. They were talking about, again, using uh, imagery and sound recording as a source of inspiration, a uh, focus of, of, of um, studies for uh, culture uh, heritage research. So one of the students was looking for images on mission uh, churches in New Mexico, was able to find some, so she was really happy about it. Um, and then their students are looking really for resources that they can reuse for different types of projects, like multimedia projects or, or um, uh, um, you know, artistic work. And um, several of the students in the, uh, the graduate group mentioned the use of DPLA for interdisciplinary research. Because one of the students was a PhD student in, in uh, religious study, and he says, well, you know, I know every single digital collection and database that has material in my area, because that's what I'm using for my research, you know. But I don't know resources in cognate areas, in other, you know, and this is wonderful, because I can search across and see what other types of materials are coming. So I think that is also uh, an interesting uh, point. And then finally, undergraduates are looking for an easy way, okay, not, <laughs> not full ourselves, something that they can uh, find a couple of resources that they can use for, for their uh, kind of general browsing. Um, they did look at exhibits, okay? I didn't even encourage them, but they look at the exhibits, and once they discover the exhibits, actually, on the PLA side, they kind of look at them as like Wikipedia articles, that you have a short narrative, and 
you can use it sort of as a starting point to, to write, a, uh, write a paper. Graduate students were more critical about the exhibits because they are looking at the, you know, as this as a scholarly resource. So, you know, one of the things they mention is that they are now, I mean, first the question they asked was, who selects those topics, okay? And the other one question was, uh, where are the sources? Who wrote that narrative and where that information came from? So I think if we are going to use that, not just for background information, but as a teaching tool, especially in higher education, I think you need to have a little bit more scholarly um, background uh, for those uh, materials. Uh, just final comments, I have to mention it's a limited pool, but it's a qualitative study. So, you know, 21 for qualitative is big. It's a lot of data, actually. Um, but you can't really generalize from that from that pool. And I have a heavy representation of, of um, graduate students. Some of those critical comments came actually from, from graduate students and faculty. Undergraduates were mostly happy with the, uh, with, uh, with the site. And... I don't think you can also transfer the findings into other segments of population, again, because I think most of the participants had that model of federated searching, which may not necessarily be true for teachers and other, um, other groups of, of, um, of uh, users. Um, as, as far as the recommendations, um, I think we need to do more outreach to librarians, because. Uh, this is publicly available resource. If you look at the library uh, uh, libguides, uh, most of the recommended materials uh, in humanities and history are the databases that libraries subscribe and paid for. I rarely recommend it freely available resources. So I think the lack of awareness is still not there. Uh, um, I think that you know the service hub and some kind of a visual clue is needed really for people to um, to move. I didn't. I don't have time to actually talk about permissions, and to a certain extent, I think this has been addressed actually by the uh, announcement that we had about uh, about the statement of rights. But I think many uh, participants notice really huge inconsistency between the rights statement between the partnering um, uh, institutions. And I think for the exhibits, I, it's really important to have um, more diverse topics. One of the participants was, a, was an African-American woman, and she looked at it, she says, there's only one exhibit about me. And you know, so I think we, we need more diversity there. And again, kind of references and the sources of, of um, information. And that's what I have, and I'm open for questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I did ask them whether they would use it, and most of them did, you know. Um, uh, and again, it was different type of usage depending whether they were undergraduates and, and, and graduates. Yes, one student said she would recommend it to her father for genealogy research. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were more excited about searching, <laughs> I have to tell you. Yeah, because they were, unless they run into an issue where they were not finding materials, but, but in most cases they were more excited because they found stuff that was really related to, to their needs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. There was one student who got into the Smithsonian, and she got some materials about the artist she was researching, and she was absolutely thrilled. I had to pull her out, actually, <laughs> you know, from, from, from that. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is that after we finished the, the, the project, all of them asked me to email them with links to DPLA and Europeana, which was always nice, yeah. Okay, so so uh, as far as yes, uh, I have. Sorry, <laughs> um, I actually got funding from my university. I'm a junior faculty, so I got a, like a you know faculty research grant, which um, allowed me to give students gift certificates, and I, you know everybody who participated got 
$30 gift card to Amazon, okay? Um, I actually got more participants that I needed. I, at one point I stopped, and I, because I done research like that before, and I realized you have to transcribe it, and especially with recorded data, there's a lot of data to analyze, okay? And again, I mentioned that I think about you know, 15, 16, 17, I mean, I, I started to hear the same things, okay, in the interviews. I was not learning anything new, so, but I had more than, than I needed. Uh, again, librarians, uh, subject librarians, like a humanities librarian was wonderful because she forwarded um, uh, an email announcement through faculty to, to those departments, and most of that came from that. I had flyers in the library, and that was also another source, yeah. So that's how I recruited them. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> of course, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, you have to have IRB approval to do any research with students, yes. So that was prior to the study, yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Well, if I can add to that, I've been using DPLA in my own teaching, actually. I've worked on, um, well, I've worked on exhibits for DPLA. This is a disclosure, <laughs> actually, two years ago on a pilot project that um, DPLA actually reached out to faculty in library information science and ask uh, graduate programs to participate in building those exhibits. Uh, the pilot uh, is over. We are not doing it anymore. But I actually continue that as one of my assignments in the class. and. I'm kind of looking at DPLA as a source of materials for reuse. So students are building exhibits in Omeka on a variety of topics, and DPLA is not the only source, but it's a good place to start, actually, to look for materials for building uh, digital, and we want to expand it now to other uh, programs on campus, you know, using DPLA as a source sort of for teaching history, especially on the, gradu on the, on the graduate level. I think it's pretty exciting if students can work kind of on hands-on projects using DPLA as a source of material for, you know, building narratives, you know, for history. Any other questions? Yes. It really depends on the resource, where the resource is coming from. If it's, if it's coming from a content hub, like let's say Smithsonian or New York Public Library, it goes directly. But if it comes from a service hub, it's the service hub is an intermediate layer. Yeah, that's what it is. That's how DPLA is structured. Whether this is going to be done differently in the future, I don't know. But at this point, at the time when I did the study, which was a couple months ago, you have those different types of hubs, and that's why you have that extra step. When, when, so let's say a resource, so I think at one point the metaphor that was used was like ponds, lakes, and ocean, <laughs> okay, for the DPLA. So you have a pond, like a small historical society, let's say, in Oregon, okay, and then the resources from those, you know, smaller institutions, smaller archives and historical societies go into a regional aggregator. So for West, that's actually Mountain West. It's a regional aggregator. And then Mountain West is a service hub that feeds into um, DPLA, okay? It would be very difficult, I think, to harvest from thousands of you know, smaller institutions. So that's the reason for that model. But from a user point, this is a little bit cumbersome. back here. Yeah, so, so basically you have that, let me go back, we'll kind of look clear here. 
So uh, when a user searches here at DPLA and goes into a service hub, in this case it's Mountain West, you have a metadata record, which is an aggregated metadata, but there's no visual clue, okay? Uh, you, there's no thumbnail. So you have that view resource, which is a direct link, but somebody, if they don't notice, well, I think it's I've, when they get into a place and it's not, that's not what they expect really, because they expect the actual object to be there, okay? And that's where the confusion comes, okay? So again, many people figured it out and it was not a problem, but for some it was confusing, okay? <laughs> okay. Yes, so I've done other studies, but again, on individual digital collections, oh, okay? Oh, okay? So that's a little bit different than large scale when you aggregate. You could probably do a good comparative study with Huffy Trust because it's centralized, okay? So that might be a good comparison, okay? But again, uh, the, on the other side, you know, many students notice you know, the benefits of that distributed model, that it takes you to the, well, first of all, there is a visibility for participating institution, which to a certain extent is lost in Happy Trust, okay? So it's not an easy answer, frankly, <laughs> here, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for coming.